Uh, it was, in fact, 40 years ago when UC Berkeley uh, changed the world forever by releasing the first version of SPICE. SPICE rapidly became the worldwide standard for circuit simulation. And tens of thousands of semiconductor chips have been designed using SPICE in the four decades since its development. Uh, SPICE was developed as a teaching tool for the university, but it was also put into the public domain and it was made available to anyone willing to pay the small fee that covered the duplication costs. It was first released within the university in 1971 and announced to the world in 1973. It's one of the best examples, I think, and possibly one of the earliest in the field of uh, what open source can really do for the world. Larry Nagel, uh, who is, of course, here tonight, was a graduate student at UC Berkeley, wrote the original version. Uh, it began as a derivative of cancer, uh, which for those of you who don't know, uh, that is an acronym. Computer Analysis of Nonlinear Circuits Excluding Radiation. That is one of the most creative acronyms ever, I think, Larry. Way to go with that. Uh, and it was uh, done as a class project under Professor Ron Moore. Ron is also here tonight. Uh, since its initial release, SPICE, like so many uh, important pieces of open source code, has been improved and rewritten uh, many times. It's used again and again at the university level. Uh, at the commercial level, it has spawned a cottage industry, uh, many flavors, and today uh, almost every major uh, EDA vendor offers some version of SPICE as a circuit emulator. In addition to this evening's celebration, earlier this week, IEEE honored the contributions of SPICE to the semiconductor and computer industries with an IEEE milestone plaque. Uh, now, for those of you who aren't entirely aware, it's not easy to get an IEEE milestone plaque. Uh, IEEE is very sparing and very selective uh, when it decides to issue these plaques and where it decides to put them. But I understand David Hodge has had a vision of where that plaque was going to go for quite some time, and it's now hanging there proudly. And as you can see, uh, it uh, commemorates it as a class project, the training that it's offered to many students, and uh, how essential its descendants have been. And it's quite fitting, given the role it's played with so many students, that it hangs at the university. Kim Haley, Kim Cunder, Larry Nagel, Ron Rohr are all here tonight to talk about the birth and the growth of SPICE. And of course, as I mentioned, David Hodges is the moderator. David is a very, very good friend of the museum. Uh, he is a uh, distinguished uh, academician. He served on many nonprofit boards uh, and for-profit company boards. And uh, he's been a real leader in the field. He is the Daniel Tellup Distinguished Professor Emeritus at Berkeley. Uh, he was the Dean of Berkeley's College of Engineering from 1990 to 1996. Uh, he held research and management positions at Bell Labs in the 60s and 70s. He was made an IEEE Fellow in 1977 and has been the recipient of many awards. Uh, and he's a trustee of the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute. We're delighted to have David to uh, moderate this panel and kick things off tonight. Please join me in welcoming him in the panel this evening. I'd like to welcome all of you tonight. I see many friends, former students in the crowd here. And uh, I'd like to start by introducing our panel. Uh, first of all, far over on the far right is uh, Ron Rohr, Professor Ron Rohr, uh, taught the class, uh, created the very first version of SPICE. Uh, Ron is a, a distinguished professor emeritus at Carnegie Mellon. Ron? Say, say a word or two. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Larry Nagel, some people call him Dr. Spice because he wrote a lion's share of the code. Uh, and uh, Larry has spent a career at Bell Labs and now is an independent, uh, independent businessman. Pleased to be here. Uh, next is uh, Kim Haley, who I believe uh, developed one of the first uh, commercial versions of Spice, uh, drawing heavily on the original work and adding a lot of value with uh, enhancements and service. Kim? Pleased to be here. And Ken Cundert, who has worked on uh, enhancements and uh, two or three attempts to replace Spice with something newer and better. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, this is Ken Cundert. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Now, I've seen already a half a dozen people who worked on SPICE in those early years, and I'd like the people who worked on SPICE in the early 70s in the class or, or in, the, in the few years after that to stand up so the audience can see how many you are. 
A lot of people that made a lot of contributions. Thank you. Now, as is customary in these sessions, we're looking at the earlier history. We're trying to look at the period from 1970 to 1990, roughly speaking. And that, that corresponds really to the period when this, some of this work was going on at the university, but also to the early and, and rapidly growing commercial application. And uh, just to get started, uh, this, this started out in 1968 when Ron, who was a faculty member at Berkeley, on leave to Fairchild to help Fairchild simulate some of their circuits was uh, Shanghai into coming back during his leave to teach what was labeled in the catalog as a circuit synthesis course. Uh, Ron, what happened next? Well, I, uh, my former research advisor, Ernie Koo, was adamant that I return to Berkeley to teach this network synthesis class. I had taken it from him 10 years earlier, but I'd never taught it and I still was working full-time at Fairchild, so there was no way I was going to be able to prepare and teach that class. Moreover, I thought that network synthesis was dead. Little did I know that Amar Bose was going to make a fortune using it to design loudspeaker enclosures. <laughs> so uh, instead of teaching that, I just went to the class and, and said, I'm, you guys are going to write a circuit simulator because that's what I was doing at Fairchild, so I knew I could do that <laughs> without doing any work. And if you write the best circuit sim simulator in the world, I'll give you all A's. And if you don't, I'm going to give you an oral final. And my oral finals were pretty notorious. In fact, I think they were referred to as anal finals <laughs> by most of the students. So uh, that's what happened. And uh, it's all so history now. Larry, what did the students think about that? They thought they were taking a synthesis class. Yeah, <laughs> there were a lot of people surprised uh, when Ron walked in that class the uh, first day, um, uh, especially after he got to the part about the exam, and he asked us if we would prefer an oral exam or an anal exam. <laughs> uh, we were looking at each other, and we were trying to figure out what have exactly have we gotten ourselves into. Uh, some of us were, were, uh, were kind of excited about the idea. And uh, uh, I had been working up on the, uh, on the Rad Lab and actually had uh, uh, really an interest in developing some simulation tools because I've been doing very high speed circuit design. And, and to get things compensated correctly, I required that I solder in various values and resistance and capacitance. And I figured there had to be a better way of doing it than that. So, uh, so yeah, what, were, what were some of the uh, initial conditions that existed then? As you, as you say, you were soldering in by hand. Uh, well, you had a pen, pen and paper and slide roll, I guess. Well, we didn't have any scientific calculators. Well, yeah, you could, uh, uh, you were, according to the old style professors of which Don Peterson was one, uh, you were supposed to be able to do everything on the back of an envelope and you really didn't even need a slide roll although that kind of got the answers a little more accurate. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, we were, we were just beginning, this was just the beginning of the integrated circuit era. And uh, uh, things were designed largely by hand and the uh, circuit designers of the time, the real heroes, uh, guys like Bob Weidler were, uh, they, didn't, they didn't use computers or you know, calculators or uh, I'm not even sure Bob used a slide rule. Um, but there were some simulators already in use some places at that time. IBM had something, and Autonetics had something. The military uh, electronics people required things with radiation. Well, well, actually, at this time, even Berkeley had some. The, uh, the original BIOS, I think BIOS was the very first simulator at Berkeley. And it was, of course, it could only do DC analysis. It had been written by <coughs> Professor Bill Howard uh, at, at the time. Uh, there were other simulators being developed. Yes, ECAP, I think, is probably the very first simulator ever written. That was an IBM product. It was ghastly to, to use. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, most of the early simulators all had the problem that they were good for about 10 transistors, and then that was sort of either the end of your computing budget or the end of your computer, one of the two, <laughs> or the end of your patience. Uh, so. Uh, 
I, I think that's probably where some of the things that we did in Ron's class, including the sparse matrix, came into, because we could actually start simulating real circuits. So I think that also it was the spike, the cancer, was the first that had built-in models, is, is that right? Well, no, all of the, uh, all of the Berkeley programs, BIAS had built-in models. The, uh, the outside programs. Uh, uh, the, yeah, it was, I, I think it was the first. Uh, most of the outside programs at that point, if you wanted to put in a device, you had to write a Fortran subroutine. Uh, anybody in this room know what Fortran is? <laughs> <laughs> good, good. I, 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 you, know, you know I'm at least 40 years old, right? Because, <laughs> but... Um, um, <laughs> Um, so you would have to write your own Fortran program and then and then link edit it into the uh, uh, the rest of ECAP or or uh, Scepter uh, and and run it and this was this was an incredibly complex procedure and certainly not one that you would even think about launching on an entire class of EE 105 uh, students, and for those of you at Berkeley at the time, you know what EE 105 is. It's a basic electronics. A uh, bunch of smart kids, but, but uh, you know, I, it would have been the end of it. So, uh, what was the uh, computing environment available at that time? Give us some of the parameters. We, 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 had, uh, we had the sister of the world's most powerful computer. The, at the time, the world's most powerful computer was a CDC 6600. We had a CDC 6400, which had only one processor instead of two, and I believe the one processor was a little slower. It had a to grand sum total of 200,000 octal words of memory, and that a word in this case is 60 bits. So uh, 200,000 octal, for those of you that are uh, computationally impaired, is uh, 64,000 words. Of memory. However, the operating system consumed about half of that, 100,000 <laughs> words. So, uh, on a on, on a on, late at night, if you bribed the operator and uh, no one was watching, you could get 140,000 octal. But during the day, when uh, all of the Berkeley bureaucrats were watching the computer, you could not get more than 100,000 octal. I remember this was a 10 megahertz clock. And it was a six million dollar computer. Yes, and it was 1971. <laughs> Moore's law has done something to computers. So, uh, Ron, what kind of circuits were were uh, were being designed at that time? We were in the MSI age, right? A, uh, a thousand transistors was a huge circuit. When I was at Fairchild, and I think again at Berkeley, but for sure at Fairchild. I limited, even though I was working for Gordon Moore, I limited the circuit size to 50 nodes and 200 devices. I figured that would be enough for all time <laughs> <laughs> for, for that mode of simulation. And, and maybe later on, I'll circle back around to that. In many ways, I think I was right. Uh, now, there's some people at the other end of the table that stretch this stuff a little further than that. But uh, I'm not so sure that was a great idea. <laughs> so if you go out in the, in the display area of the, of the museum here, you can see some sample, some wafers from that period, and it's typically uh, five, uh, it's typically eight or ten micron design rules, and uh, uh, you fill up a pretty good sized chip with a 74181, which was a four-bit AOU. Uh, so things were a little more uh, primitive at that time. We've come a long way since that time. So, what was the, what was the, uh, what did circuit designers need? They really needed several forms of analysis, right? Some of the programs only provided one form of analysis. Well, the, for for the most part, what we had was kind of a a, a patchwork of programs. We had uh, we had bias, which could figure out DC bias points. Uh, we had um, uh, sync or slick, I'm sorry, which could figure out the poles and zeros of an AC circuit and do AC analysis. And we had a program that was written in autonetics called TRAC. And uh, this, this relates back to cancer because the R in cancer is radiation and the R in TRAC is radiation. So TRAC was written for radiation. We were very proud of the fact that cancer was written not to include radiation. 
Uh, the, the problem was, of course, that, that you had to have three different input files, input decks, actually, decks of cards. Uh, somebody had to make sure that these decks were consistent, and that turned out to be the student, and uh, it was a very painful process. Uh, you'd make one change, you'd have to change it in three places, and if you didn't change it in the right place, you'd be doing a transient analysis of a different circuit than you were doing your AC analysis and trying to figure out why the rise time was five nanoseconds, but the, uh, resp uh, the AC frequency response was only 10 kilohertz. Um, and you had to try to explain that to your research advisor as well, because uh, he, usually, he or she usually caught that. So I think, I think the class went through this process uh, in stages. It was three quarters of class, right? And then you first, Ron, how did that go? Well, we started out, I think we had 14 students. And they fell into line fairly fast, with the exception of one who kept complaining to me <laughs> that uh, she wouldn't pass the qualifying because I wasn't teaching network synthesis. <laughs> we, and we divided the class roughly along these lines. We did DC in the first quarter. And then we did, I think we did transient next and then AC in the no, final. AC next. AC next and then transient, OK. He knows. He, he was in the class. I was just in front of it. the scars. <laughs> and and uh, it, they, they really became enthusiastic very fast and divided the task. I, I let them lead themselves, and they did. And uh, I was just their consultant, really. And uh, it, it, it was a great class. And I want to say, that if I had it to do over again, I probably wouldn't do that for the following reason. I've tried similar classes in a number of institutions with a number of students, and they've all been abject failures, except for that one first time. And I think that that was a success because Larry Nagel was in that class. Thank you. <laughs> So I think you kept encountering uh, problems that other people had too, like the, the circuit size was limited. You had how did you how could you fit it into the memory? And uh, it was clear that you needed some breakthrough. What you know? What about so for instance, you had to you tried to diagonalize the matrices, but then you found other ways to uh, do even better, Ron. You, you can talk to that. Uh, one of our one of the students in the class was a mechanical engineer who was trying to take this as his minor. So he came to me and he said, what can I do? I don't know anything about circuits. You're certainly not teaching me anything. And <laughs> I, I said, what's new? I have tenure. I don't have to teach you anything. <laughs> but, so I said, well, you know, there's this thing called sparse matrices, and uh, I don't have it in my Fairchild program. Why don't you do that for us? And he did. So that was the start of that. And his name was his name was Bob Berry. Really. Yeah. Still Great. is. Yeah, his name <laughs> still was. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, as, as as I mentioned, almost all of the programs of the era were, were extremely limited. And 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 the, the 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 size of circuits, even in 1971, if you look at a uh, uh, 741 op amp, it has more than 10 transistors in it. And uh, 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 really, these things would take uh, 10 transistors, and, and, and they would smoke along for minutes or hours. And if you ran minutes of program on a CDC 6400, your professor was coming after you, because that was the year's computing budget. And uh, you know, yeah, we, we were allowed 10 octal seconds, maximum time limit. Uh, I, think, I think when we got to be graduate students, we were allowed 100 octal seconds per job. Uh, good luck running a 741 with that, with the, with the tools available. So I would say sparse matrices was definitely the biggest breakthrough in terms of actually being able to uh, run large circuits economically. So uh, you should all know in the audience that each of these people on the podium and several others who were part of the early activity have, has written an article for a, an issue of the Solid State Circuits magazine, which will be coming out in two or three months. Uh, and uh, Ron, Ron had a piece that he actually wrote back in 1992 and uh, telling the story about, about uh, 
the early days when he, he confessed that uh, early in his career he thought that optimization might be the solution to designing circuits. Elaborate on that? <laughs> <laughs> I actually, when I left, took my leave from Berkeley to go to Fairchild, that's what I sold him on. I was going to replace circuit designers with optimization. <laughs> and uh, didn't work. Uh, <laughs> but, but the first thing that happened was uh, that the only public domain, that some simulators that were around have been mentioned, like track and what have you. The only public domain one was IBM's ECAP program. And ECAP had piecewise linear device models. And the, my, one of my bosses, Andy Grove, didn't think that was adequately accurate. In consequence, I had to instantiate accurate models. And I think that's what got the whole embedded model accuracy thing going. The other thing we had to face was mil-spec temperature range. That's what got the program sold in the first place. Minus 55 to plus 125 degrees C. So Larry talked about things taking a few minutes. Well, the computer I had at Fairchild was a 32K byte IBM machine that was dog slow. But it was faster to freeze and cook a circuit in the simulator than it was in a refrigerator and oven. And that's what sold it. <laughs> so, uh, how, so I know that very soon you started using this program, I know when I started teaching undergraduate classes in 1970, we were already using SPICE for the undergraduates, but I, I, I don't remember how this, how, what the student response was to this. It was a little, a little uh, trying to go out down there, punch your cards and put them in a stack and let it run overnight and find out you'd made a mistake in your input deck. Well, it was all part of uh, becoming an electrical engineer at Berkeley. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the, the way it worked actually was that uh, I, I mentioned that uh, uh, during the day uh, it, was, it was students who were learning how to program would run their jobs. So we couldn't run except at night. And uh, uh, a fellow classmate of mine, Dick Dowell, who I don't know if he's in the room or not, uh, he won't admit it if he is. Uh, and I, uh, we would gather up. This, all, of this, all of the students would punch up a deck, but they couldn't just take them over across the street and, and run them. They had to submit them to us. We would batch them all together uh, late at night and run them on the computer and then leave the printouts down, in the, uh, down on a, a bookcase so the students could come and get it the next morning. So they had, uh, this was how we enforced 24-hour turnaround time because there was no way they could that Dick and I were going over to that computer center uh, more than once a night. So, uh, nonetheless, uh, quite a bit of uh, student learning went on, and uh, uh, you guys, uh, I want the audience to know that another aspect of this was that when bugs appeared in the program, Larry and, and Dick were the guys who had to fix it, and they did fix it uh, within that 24-hour turnaround time. So there were other uh, enhancements added, such the, the uh, uh, there's a guy here who, uh, Lynn Weber, who did the, uh, the noise analysis. Yeah, that's, that's how I know that we did AC analysis before transient analysis, because if we'd have done transient analysis first, Lynn wouldn't have had anything to put noise analysis in. So we had some uh, partners outside the university as well, and uh, particular uh, instrument companies, Tektronix and Hewlett Packard both uh, were very interested for their own internal use. And they, they employed some Berkeley graduates and they heard about this and started to use it. So uh, we had quite a good pattern of uh, exchange of people. That is, students would go to the company for a month or a summer or uh, People would come from the companies and work with us and uh, build enhancements. Uh, I know, Ron, you, 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 were, you were involved in a lot of those, uh, weren't you? Those relationships? Yes. <laughs> I, I would freely ship my students out to industry, and, which I always have. I think it's a good thing to do. So uh, uh, the godfather here actually was, was Don Peterson, who's known to many of you. And 
uh, let's see, you, you later amended the, the pass-fail criteria for the course to include a, a criteria. Yes, yeah, the, the amended criteria was that Don Peterson, who as Larry said, was a dedicated back of the envelope circuit design advocate, had to approve of the program. That was, that was the criterion for them getting their A's. And I don't know whether he approved of it, but they told me he did. <laughs> in, in fact, that's how I sort of ended up being the ad hoc uh, team leader of the project because I had done undergraduate research with Don Peterson. And um, uh, I can tell you that the students in Ron's class took him at his word when, when, when he said that uh, uh, if, we didn't, if we didn't get Don Peterson's approval, we weren't going to pass the class. And uh, this, this, put a lot of, this put a lot of fear in some of these students. So when they knew that, that I, had, I knew Don and I'd done some work with him, they immediately said, well, you're the one who's going to take it, to, who's going to make sure that Don approves of the project. And he did. Now, Kim was the guy who really took this into a, a commercial product fairly early on. How did you get into this, Kim? Well, Sean and I came from the circuit design background. One of the things that, when you try to design circuits, you determine how the tools just don't work. And after you know many years of that, we decided to uh, start our own company. You know, one of the things we decided that they had left out of Spice was a price tag, so. <laughs> <laughs> we, neither one of us had gone to, through the UC Berkeley, so we didn't have any pre-designed concepts of how it ought to be. There were a couple of Spice simulators out there. The uh, iSpice was time-shared, and a lot of companies were starting to use it and spend a lot of money on it. This is about the time that the uh, mini, or mini computer revolution was starting to happen and people were starting to have computers available to engineers. So ultimately we looked at taking the SPICE program, porting it to many of the uh, IBM mainframes and of course it can't come from there but with a great deal of modification. We had a Cray version and DEC versions and by uh, being able to sell it to each organization so they could run as many computers as they wanted with our program, uh, it really freed the engineers up to be able to do a lot more analysis of much larger circuits. So over the years, it just grew and grew. We had an <coughs> enormous amount of input from other design engineers. And coming from the design background, it made it easy for us to understand what the problems were and then to figure out how to go back into the SPICE code and get the results that they needed. You worked on models quite a bit, right? There was an ecosystem that got built up. The engineers needed good models. And today, if you listen to the people talking about SPICE, everyone complains about the models. The modeling back then was uh, pretty coarse. A lot of the built-in models in SPICE uh, worked at the larger geometries, but all of the engineers were working on next generation products. So our uh, approach was to actually build test chips to do the modeling in-house and to be able to guarantee that the engineers had a model that worked with HBIs. And that turned out to be one of the cohesive elements that uh, bound the engineers to the people and the fabs to us providing the circuit tools. So uh, you proved in fairly good order that a uh, for-profit business model could actually coexist side by side with a university distribution that sold for 20 bucks. I think we only paid six dollars and fifty cents for our copy, but <laughs> <laughs> came on a small magnetic tape. Uh, it was a, sort of an interesting uh, trial of t what price would you sell the program for, because people wanted support, and every organization had to have an in-house person or two to support 
their spice effort. That came at a price tag, and basically we looked at supporting, you know, replacing that in-house person with our support. And most people in, you know, designing circuits, they don't want things to break down. And, you know, as uh, Larry certainly knows, when you get that phone call in the middle of the night saying something's broken, you have to fix it. And you get a reputation for being able to fix it. And I think the, the other key thing was the engineering community was sort of disconnected. Uh, they just needed tools that worked. Uh, fortunately for us, this was the, the golden era of uh, EDA, of electrical engineering design. This is when you know, a lot of money was being spent and it was growing so fast that uh, I don't think that a lot of organizations knew what they were spending on EDA tools, at least in the uh, 90s. So uh, it gave us a lot of room to grow. And I, I remember counting up one time uh, when uh, we sold uh, our company to Avante, that we had sold over 11,000 copies of HBIS. Terrific. So at the same time, however, for quite a few years, IBM and Bell Labs and other large firms went on internally developing their own simulation programs, sometimes with kinship to SPICE, and not, but not always. Some of these companies did magnificent efforts, but ultimately, you get worn down by uh, you're serving a relatively small segment of the uh, design community. And uh, when we looked at all of our users, we had people from every realm, uh, CMOS, uh, Bipolar, uh, CMOS on Sapphire, and there were so many novel designs that would certainly cause Spice to choke. And each one of those times that Spice choked on that design, it gave us an opportunity to fix another couple of lines of code. And that experience ultimately, I think, uh, helped us to establish ourselves. In addition to that, as uh, being in Silicon Valley, a lot of our initial users, uh, companies like AMD, spawned a number of other companies They'd use HBICE at the previous company. They got out their purchase order book when they got to wherever they were uh, landed, bought another copy of HBICE. And it was that familiarity, I think, that ultimately allowed us to, uh, to uh, grow quite fast. So did you, uh, so apparently you didn't feel any problem with working side by side with the, the free unsupported version because basically what you were selling was support. True, and the, the free version was uh, you know, good training wheels for people to learn the program. It certainly made our, our business model work a lot more efficiently because people already knew how to write a spice deck. They knew how to do simulations. The training was excellent. And that goes as well with the companies uh, you know, that had in-house uh, circuit simulators they had trained their people well, and that was, uh, you know, just a bonus to us because we didn't have to spend time training them. So it was a win-win situation. Then we kept graduating students from Cal, and people would hire them, and the students said, I can't do this job without spikes. <laughs> I had people, as, as a professor, I had uh, employers complaining about the fact the students uh, insisted on having this expensive new tool to do their work. So uh, I, a lot of people say that, that Spice really came into its own when, when the VAX came out, because the VAX was cheap enough that an engineering group could own, own the VAX, and it was adequate to run, being a full one or two MIPS machine, it was adequate to run Spice on the circuits at that time. There were thousands of them, and it was a, an amazing uh, piece of hardware. It was a very robust, uh, Engineers loved them. It was easy to use. And, uh, you know, for us to be able to sell a uh, product into that marketplace, we had a lot of support from DEC. And then after DEC, of course, was Sun. And uh, 
the Sun people would just bend over backwards to uh, help us uh, with accounts and provided plenty of hardware at uh, trade shows. So uh, the hardware manufacturers in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, it was pretty insane. At one time we had 22 different ports, different hardware. And uh, there was a uh, time that there was a new piece of hardware every couple of months. And uh, so you, you delivered object code to pilot flights, right? Or yes. Yeah. So the, the, those, your customers were not able to do their own model enhancements? We had uh, mechanisms. Uh, anyone who had uh, built in, uh, anyone who had done modeling before, who had their own in-house spy simulator, wanted to be able to add their own models. So it was easy enough to link that into the object code. And we had a number of people do that. But at the end of the day, uh, most people would work with us We'd build the models in, and it was a very synergistic uh, activity because the more people that looked at an enhancement to uh, SPICE, the, the better it became. So Ken, when did you get, when did you start getting into this? Uh, after 1990, basically. I don't know why I'm even up here. <laughs> 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 we had that one <laughs> But you, 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 uh, you, you made serious attempts to, uh, to display Spice as, as the uh, major player in the field. I did, yeah. Um, when I was in school, I, was, I went to Berkeley as well and studied in the CAD group uh, with, with Don Peterson. And, uh, professor San Giovanni was my professor. Um, and we were focused on, on simulation. Uh, my thing was a little different. I, I, was, I had come from Hewlett Packard. Uh, in a microwave group, and, and I saw that there was something interesting in doing microwave simulation, so I tried that, did harmonic balance. Um, but of course, I knew there was no future in it, so once I graduated, I... <laughs> <laughs> it became a product. It, uh, it, it, it turned out it did okay, yeah. yeah. But uh, when, I, when I graduated, I took my program that I'd written, and I, I converted it into a general purpose spice simulator to try to compete with H-Spice, actually. Yeah. It was not an easy task. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you've, you've written about this in your article that will be forthcoming. You, you want to say a little more? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, the HSPICE, I think, was, um, you know, I didn't really understand the strength of the, of the HSPICE product at the time. It was clearly the models. Um, from a simulation perspective, I could kind of look at the algorithms and realize they were they were somewhat dated, and so I figured it was going to be kind of an easy thing to just produce a new modern uh, simulator and try to get uh, to get market share. Um, and we did that. We put it out at Cadence, the Suspector Simulator, and and it really did not get market share. Um, and I was a little surprised by that. And even though there were people all around me saying, "What are you crazy?" <laughs> you know, HSPICE really had a very dominant market share at that point. Um, but I kept at it, and I kept trying. Um, and what I figured was is some unique uh, feature was what we needed. Clearly, you know, the, a, little, a little better speed, a little better convergence was not going to do it. Um, and so then we decided to try to do um, a behavioral simulation. Um, we put out a product called Spectre HDL, which was a precursor to a to Verilog A. Um, we were thinking that that would be very unique, but then it turns out that, you know, it was, it was unique. There was, was really no IC simulators that had behavioral modeling at that time. But it turns out that trying to get people to learn how to do behavioral modeling was not an easy, not an easy thing. And so it took a very, very long time for that to kind of, to, to become established. Have to come back and teach a few classes how to do it at Berkeley. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, l let's uh, talk about the, uh, the future of SPICE. Is, is this going to be with us forever? I mean, it's, it's endured through how many generations of new technology and new models. And, uh, and uh, at the root, there's, there's a lot of uh, constancy, no change. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if you look at SPICE, it's basically the same as today as it was back then, which is uh, it's a direct method implicit solver. The direct method means that it uses a matrix to solve the whole equations, and implicit meaning that, um, I don't know, it's implicit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's been the same way. In 
people have been trying to change that for many years. People have tried to break that. Uh, the fast timing simulators try to, to move to explicit <laughs> methods where you can kind of predict the past, the future directly from the past without knowing anything about the future. Um, you know, and that works okay for digital circuits, but it's not really suitable for analog mixed signal circuits. It always kind of breaks down for those. So I think that, uh, you know, SPICE is going to stay the way, you know, largely the way it is for until, you know, something major changes, and I don't, I don't see what that would be. Hey, Ron, what do you say? Well, I think when I taught that class at Berkeley, if you think about the graduate student experience as being on a spectrum between innovation on one end and implementation on the other end, I inadvertently moved that needle away from innovation and toward implementation. So that particularly in electronic design automation, most of what happens in universities isn't innovation, it's implementation. There's damn little innovation, far too little, which I think is why SPICE has lasted so damn long. <laughs> <laughs> so come on, are we gonna have, you, you foresee something new on the horizon? Yes. What is that? Something I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> now that he has to put up with a bunch of graduate students. <laughs> so a lot of people have, have asserted or asked, uh, wasn't Spice uh, really the, uh, the pioneer in open source for software? And uh, you know what you have to do is go back and look and see that Fortran code for technical problems was being written by physicists for high energy physics and other applications, but there was not very much that ever appeared to have commercial value, it seems to me, that was made open source before we got to SPICE. Uh, and then after that, a lot of other things uh, came open source. <laughs> But interestingly, we've had uh, parallel existence and actually fruitful and, and uh, successful exist coexistence of open source models, of open source models with, uh, you know, for-profit models. So it's a philosophical question. Uh, I, uh, what, uh, what do you think should be claimed for Spice in this respect? I think th there, was, uh, there was a special set of circumstances with SPICE, uh, and it's, there's some parallels between SPICE and, uh, and Unix, the uh, open source Unix that came out of Berkeley about 15, 10 years later. Uh, and, and that is, it, it's a combination of, first of all, first at Berkeley, all of the students learned SPICE, so and, and the program was free. So when they went off to work in, in various companies, they took SPICE with them. And it was like uh, uh, an, an exponential growth. When people went off to teach from Berkeley, they went off to teach at other schools. They took SPICE with them and they taught SPICE at those schools. And, and uh, I, would, I would venture to say now that there, there aren't any electrical engineers in this room who didn't have to learn SPICE. Uh, in their undergraduate engineering curriculum. It just, it became completely pervasive. So therefore there was a, there was a tremendous audience out there of, of people who knew how to use SPICE, who wanted to add things that they needed into SPICE, and who could benefit by having an open source community where there were lots of other people doing the same thing. The, the, the same thing is also true with, with Unix. Uh, the computer science classes at, at Berkeley were teaching all of the students how to use Unix. All of the class projects ran on Unix at the same time that Bill Joy was actually rewriting Unix to become what we now call BSD Unix. Uh, so again, there was a huge cadre of, of computer types who uh, learned Unix, knew Unix, could get Unix for free, and therefore it was a, their logical choice of an operating system if they wanted to do new things with Unix. There, some of the other open source programs, um, uh, Ron mentioned one, uh, uh, ECAP was 
open source, was it not? At least it was free. It was well, freely it was free because IBM wanted you to buy their iron. Yeah. Right, but, but who could figure out how to run ECAP? I mean, I've, I've, I've run ECAP. I wrote Spice, and, I, and I've tried to figure out how to run ECAP. And, and I, I don't think I ever got over the threshold. Uh, I think I did get an RC program, uh, RC circuit to run on ECAP. But, but and I, I, I just uh, crashed and burned when it came to putting a transistor in. Uh, it, it just, I just couldn't do it. So uh, that, therefore, there was not a huge cadre of people who were loyal ECAP users. And as a result, even though it was free, nobody wanted it. So uh, it wasn't very successful. Well, we got a lot of free labor from the undergraduates in debugging the user interface. That's true. <laughs> That's true, and many of them are here in the room now. <laughs> I hope they're not going to be waiting for me out in the parking lot. <laughs> so the, the university did get criticism at times for uh, destroying what should have been a commercial business, but uh, Kim Haley and others proved that that wasn't the fact. And uh, from the other direction, the university got criticism for not uh, protecting this intellectual property and extracting license revenue and so on. And uh, I think that the lesson we learned from this very strongly, and it, it remains true, that when your project is largely funded, uh, uh, enabled by public grants, a public university, uh, federal grants, gifts from supporters, uh, there's an awful lot to be said for the open source uh, policy that in the end produced, uh, many of you may know that uh, we, we built a fifth floor out of Corey Hall largely with gifts from, the largest gift was from Deck. Deck said, Spice sold a thousand vaccines. So our licensing guy said, well, I did tell you, you should, be, you should be protecting Spice and licensing it, but I don't think you ever would have gotten $18 million in license revenue. <laughs> That's all it cost to build a fifth floor 15 years ago. <laughs> so we, we have, have somebody circulating in the audience with cards for questions, and uh, uh, I, I'd like people to think, there's one, one question I have here that I'm not sure the panel can answer, but uh, we see an awful, not so many full custom designs going on anymore, an awful lot of things being implemented with FPGA, either you use a microprocessor or you use an FPGA or you use some, use some other approach, basically trying to trying to attack the high front end costs of doing full custom design. So those of you who are, who are working in design organizations, is the amount of spice going down? You don't use spice to do your FPGA, uh, you use your Xilinx tools. So I'd like to have uh, somebody, if somebody wants to talk on that point, I'll take them straight from the audience. Can I talk on that point, Dave? Yeah. You're kind of a digital centric guy in spite of your many analog contributions. And what the digital side of the design spectrum has managed to do for a variety of reasons is render the process hierarchical. So they will run a ton of spice on a family, a library of gates, and they'll run it at all the design corners and the temperatures and all that. And then it's encapsulated in something called dot lib, which is if the input slope is this, the output slope is that, if the load capacitor is that, and that's good enough for them, and that's their knowledge of transistors. Over on the analog RF side, there's no such encapsulation, there's no such hierarchy, and so SPICE is still, or some SPICE derivative, is still the only game in town. Yeah, I think the, uh, the largest number of CPU cycles, SPICE CPU cycles, as, as Ron said, are going to library characterization, which is basically analyzing the same small little logic circuits that we analyzed 40 years ago. So uh, uh, why would SPICE need to change? It, it, it worked 40 years ago. Uh, nobody is going to run a 3.1 billion transistor Intel processor on SPICE. Uh, maybe somebody would like to, but uh, because then you wouldn't have to worry about accuracy concerns. But it, it, it's just, it's, it's not in, in, in the deck. So, so it's uh, uh, a lot of the, most of the circuits in SPICE are, are relatively small. But I know all sorts of people who would like to run SPICE or something like it 
on a full 256 polar transceiver. Sure. Would like to. Yes, yeah. would like to. So we have some very good questions from the audience here, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to order them a little bit, but uh, some are directed to specific. Uh, the first, uh, is there a Spice app in the Apple Store? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not yet, but who could tell? One of these guys might be working on it. <laughs> does the Spice, does the early Spice source code still exist? Absolutely, you can get a, uh, to the best of my knowledge, you can get a copy of uh, SPICE 2G.6 uh, on the uh, uh, Berkeley uh, website and download it. And if you can find a Fortran compiler, you can, <laughs> you, you can compile it and, and, and run it. And certainly SPICE 3, 3E and 3F both. Uh, Tom Quarles, I know, is in the audience. He'll be glad to help you compile it on any. <laughs> uh, they're available on the SPICE website. And of course, now that everything is in the clouds and on the web, uh, there, there are no charges. They're absolutely free. You can go home tonight and download SPICE and spend the rest of the night trying to get it to compile. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the History Museum would like to have you donate that source code. <laughs> Excuse me? The, the Computer History Museum would like to have a donation of that early source code, but you've just told them they can go download it for free. Yeah. You can download it. <laughs> now, now, if anybody has a uh, eight boxes of punched cards of the original Spice Club, <laughs> that would be one hell of a contribution to this museum. I unfortunately threw mine away. <laughs> what a stupid move that was. And uh, Kim, uh, uh, the museum would be interested in an early version of H Spice. We actually have a, a listing that's about four or five inches thick, which is uh, one of the first listings that I can remember that uh, we might do that. There you go. So what's, here's a little more serious question. What was Spice imperative to the microprocessor rev revolution? Did Intel use it to design the 4004 chip? I think I know the answer to that, but let's see if there's somebody in the audience who knows the answer to that. I think that Stan Mazur wrote a, a, a circuit simulator that was used for the 4004 design cycle. Yes. Any, any uh, contradiction or co confirmation? There's a hand up over there. And? That's right, Ted Hoff and, and Stan Mazur. David, we, can, we need to get you on the, on the tape. Yeah, I'll read, so the question was, uh, uh, David Angst asks, says that when he first went to Intel, they were working with the internal simulator that Stan Mazur and Ted Hoff had developed, and they wanted uh, a co copy of H Spice 2, but apparently they didn't want to buy it. They wanted it for free. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few shares of stock. It wasn't our business model. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, Ron, I think you already answered this, Ron, but what was, it, what was uh, how did your Fairchild experience affect the Spice project? I think it was, that was it. I essentially, uh, it, Larry is just sung the praises of two proprietary pieces of software the circuit simulator at Fairchild FairCirc and Unix, it was a Bell Labs that Berkeley laundered into the public domain. Uh, <laughs> so it seems to be the function of Berkeley. <laughs> uh, Ron, what was it like to work for Gordon Moore? Did you indeed work for Gordon Moore? Yes, but I was a few levels below Gordon Moore. <laughs> Actually, not to, let's see, I was, it was noise more grow than my boss, than me. And uh, yes, I met with Gordon Moore, but not often. I met with Andy Grove more often, who was vitally interested in the uh, 
accuracy of the models. Tell us how the open source nature of SPICE enabled innovation and entrepreneurship. Well, we see Kim Haley here, and uh, but, you know, open source is one of those wonderful things that you can pick up the source code and you can just knock yourself out if you really are interested in it. Uh, open source is, uh, I think, the way to go. It's, uh, it spreads the knowledge around and all of that development was done at the cost of the, uh, you know, taxpayers among others. So uh, why not put it back into uh, seeing if someone will pick it up. It was arcane enough that you know, it wasn't like Unix that you might run on your own uh, operating system at home, you know. So uh, the number of people and a lot of those people in this room who picked up Spice and managed to figure out how to modify it and how to get it to work to do what they wanted to do with it, it's a real testimonial to uh, it was a great program and it was a great learning tool. One of the projects that, that we contemplated doing uh, as a part of this celebration was to try to come up with a spice family tree that showed all of the derivatives of spice. I grossly underestimated the amount of effort required in that task. Uh, and I, uh, we ended up not doing it because I was afraid that we were going to leave off something and hurt more feelings than make more people feel bad than make people feel good. But there's literally dozens of versions of Spice that are um, modifications of Berkeley Spice 2 or Berkeley Spice 3 that then be, that were then marketed, sold in the public domain. So uh, I, you all know about H Spice, of course. You know about P Spice. Uh, every major electronics company had some kind of Spice, uh, uh, and uh, the, the industry, there was just an industry of selling spices. There is still an industry of selling spices. So I, I think there can be no doubt that, that making spice freely available to anyone who wanted to, as Kim said, bring in a tape. Or in fact, I think we even gave you the tape. But anyway, um, uh, it just made, made that program available and people could take their own ideas, add them to Spice, and market it as their own version of Spice, A Spice, B Spice, all the way to X Spice. Uh, and uh, 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 the, the industry flourished. It was amazing. Let me go on with the questions. Uh, the audience has uh, got a lot of ideas here. BSD has been stolen by a USSR. Well, it isn't USSR anymore. It's, <laughs> has Spice been stolen? Well, it, it, has Spice been stolen by Russia or China? It's you know, not been stolen because it's free. <laughs> <laughs> when I, before I came over here, I was pondering the question about licensing, and I just typed in on Google H Spice license, and this bit torrent comes up, get the latest version of H Spice with the code generator for the license file. So yeah, it's uh, <laughs> unbelievable. A <laughs> uh, uh, couple of questions about, uh, do we know of any planned extensions for quantum or optical devices or MEMS? There is a MEMS extension somewhere. I think we're all out of the business of maintaining spices. <laughs> <laughs> well, I worked on trying to put MEMS extensions into Verilog A, and, and it kind of floundered because there wasn't a lot of interest from the MEMS, MEMS community. But it's an interesting problem. So to Kim Haley, what were the challenges converting a free software to a commercial product? I think that's basically what you've spoken about. Uh, and you said, how many 11,000 people paid? 11,000 buyers paid. Can we repeat this in Web 2.0 in the cloud? <laughs> well, it was a good business. Uh, I think the key, <laughs> the key there is that a, a lot of people have gone into the spice business, and we weren't the first. There was, uh, you know, iSpice. Uh, but the real advantage, I think, comes once you line up the fabs and you get the light, the the models embedded into your software and you get a number of people using those models and their customers use that version of Spice, then all of that feeds back on each other and 
There was a question earlier, you know, why couldn't you just give, you know, a, a company a, a SPICE program? Well, the models weren't there. And in HSPICE, I think we had uh, over 28 MOS models, and each one of those models had, you know, four or five different variations used by different organizations. So uh, e even if you had the models and had the, the, even if you had the source code, you couldn't really figure out how some of that stuff worked. You know, uh, the, the modeling was uh, the key, I think, to the SPICE business. And it was so important that uh, you know, we, we saw that immediately in working, you know, how close could you get to the fabs? And that was, I think, where the success came in. In fact, there are a couple of questions from the audience about MOS modeling, which we really didn't talk much about. But uh, when I came from Bell to Berkeley, I had been working on MOS memory at Bell Labs. And uh, so Larry very kindly put the MOS model that Hal Schickman and I had developed into SPICE, and that was the original MOS model, and uh, many... It's still the best. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so with the scaling, it really had got outrun, so, so BCM3 is the current model, which was done by uh, faculty uh, of Chen Minghu and Pinko and others at Berkeley, which is now uh, part of Berkeley SPICE, and I think other people use it as well. You, anybody comment on MOS model? Dave, you're affectionately known as level two. That's right. <laughs> level two model. Well, we've had a very good evening here, and I think uh, thanks to the audience for a lot of questions, and uh, uh, appreciate your attention and interest. The program.